Exhale. Halt. Breathe in. Arm. <laughs> Please be seated. <laughs> when I was a young lieutenant, one of the first things I learned was that a plan, regardless of how good it is, only survives first contact with the enemy. Uh, we've had some challenges this morning. Uh, when I arrived here, we had uh, sufficient uh, flag bearers to bring in the uh, flags. But in fact, we took some casualties along the way. Uh, there are other, and rightly so, ceremonies going on in this area commemorating the attack on Pearl Harbor. The Marine Corps is also having a drive for Toys for Tots. And the Air Force is also uh, collecting funds and toys for disadvantaged children. And so we took some casualties along the way. You saw that uh, one of our, uh, the Air Force flag, uh, took a casualty. But like the Air Force has always done, and every service has always done, it'll be back and ready to, uh, ready to go. Um, I'm cautiously optimistic that uh, that will be the, la the last uh, change that we have, but uh, one never knows. I think. In fact, I know the servicemen and servicewomen today can in fact react to almost anything that comes up. And that's not unlike what they did on the 7th of December, 1945, at 1225 our time in the morning here when uh, Pearl Harbor uh, was attacked. We're actually here today, in my opinion, to uh, commemorate those 2,930 servicemen who lost their life and 49 civilians who lost their life during the attack on Pearl Harbor. But I think we're also here to uh, solemnly uh, reaffirm the legacy that they left us, a legacy of service, dedication, sacrifice and believing in something larger than themselves. And we are fortunate here at the National Museum of the Pacific War to have a significant collection of artifacts, letters, documents, uh, over, over 50,000 to be exact. And I would like to ask one of the cadets from uh, the uh, Junior Naval ROTC at the Fredericksburg High School to come up and share with you a letter that we have that was written home by a sailor on the USS Arizona from Texas. It was written in November of 1941 explaining why he would not be able to come home for Christmas. Thank <laughs> you. 
Grover Baron Bishop was a Texas serving on the USS Arizona in 1941. This is an excerpt from one of his last letters home. USS Arizona, 9 November, 1941. Dear Dad and folks, It sure has been a long time since I've gotten a letter from that part of the world. I'm beginning to wonder just why there isn't any more mail. Maybe there is so much cotton in the gin that you just don't have time. Boy, I was sure a sick boy for a while. I still am off a week and still have a heavy cough, but am up and around. I still am not back to regular duty, but I am on light duty list. Doctor says I'll have to take it easy for a while. Dad, on all of my beneficiary slips, I put Ladonius at Johnny's and Sammy's address. If something should happen to me, they'll wire here. So if anything comes for her, you take it and of course notify her. That is the easiest way as each time your address changes, a new slip must be made out and sworn to. This way the address is permanent and saves lots and lots of trouble for the overworked yeoman. Dad, I am tempted to ship over in the outfit without even a crack at the outside. Also am now, also am tempted to ship over early and try to make arrangements to, to get leave over Christmas. As it stands now, I'm almost positive we'll be here during the month of December. As you know, Christmas under a palm tree won't be Christmas to us here loving people. The Army seems to be having a little trouble over morale. Well, maybe the morale is low and maybe the morale of the Navy isn't so high, but once we start fighting, that'll all be forgotten. The men out here are hard worked and would like to see the fleet return, but we have faith. We believe the President will return us home just as soon as he thinks it is safe. For that reason, and because we know it is the best interest of the nation, we don't mind it so much. In a few more months, we'll all be native anyway. It won't matter then. I say the morale of the ship is as high as it has ever been. One thing that would help would be the war with Japan. That would give us confidence in ourselves and at the same time furnish a lot of good training. Well, folks, in about five minutes, the lights go off and the mail closes before Reveille in the morning. So I'll cut this short. Just remember how very much I think of you and write me soon as your letters mean so much. Lots and lots of love to all from Baron. No one can read a lot of history about World War II and the major operations and the major battles, but to me, a letter like that, the stories that are represented by all the plaques here in the memorial courtyard really speak to what these men and women did uh, during uh, a very trying time uh, during, at the start and then during World War II. And yes, we are here to commemorate those individuals who paid the ultimate sacrifice on the 7th of December. But I think we're also here to honor those individuals who survived. And even though, as I talked about at the start, uh, about plans not always going the way that you hoped they would go, uh, they didn't whine, and they didn't complain. They just got down to what they knew they had to do. And that was winning the war in the Pacific, which they did. It was also coming home as part of what Tom Brokaw called the greatest generation. Going to school, going back to farms, going back to businesses, and turning this country into the, in my opinion, economic, political, and diplomatic powerhouse that it is today. And we are fortunate to have four Pearl Harbor survivors with us today. I would like to uh, call out their names and recognize them. And if you can, sirs, uh, when I call your name, if, uh, if you would stand uh, to be recognized. First, an individual who drove down from Waco this morning in order to be with us, J.C. Alston. You may remain standing if you like, sir. Uh, Richard Cunningham.
Robert Brown. And Mr. Bernie Kelly. Thank you very much for what you did and the standards you have set for all young men and women in the armed forces today. And the servicemen and service women did do a marvelous job during that time. But there is another group that we don't often recognize, and I think that we should, and that's the families that stood with them, not knowing whether they were going to come back, but were still very proud of the service that they gave. In my mind, those families also served, and I would like to thank you all for that. We have this great choir from the Heritage School, and I believe, if my information is correct, they are going to sing, at least part of uh, their program will be the service songs. And if you'd like, when your service song is played, you may stand up.
would like to thank uh, Deborah Gunter and the choir from Heritage School very much for a fabulous performance. I think we're really quite lucky here in this great community to have uh, young men and women who want to come here and want to participate uh, in this uh, commemoration and in this ceremony. I mean, that's, that's the future of our country right there. It's my great pleasure to introduce our speaker this morning. And as my custom, I make an assumption that everyone can read. So I am not going to read his bio or uh, repeat his bio. Uh, I'd like to mention a couple of things that uh, are not on that piece of paper, and maybe one thing that is on that piece of paper, but not absolutely correct. Those of you who read it carefully, uh, may have read that he graduated from the uh, U.S. Military Academy, West Point, in 1998. <laughs> uh, he did, I, as I told him watching, walking over, I said, Paul oh, Rich, you're a superstar. <laughs> 1998, here we are, 2012, and you're, on, you're, you're already a colonel, sort of like George Washington. Uh, actually, it was 1989 that he graduated from, uh, uh, from West Point. Um, and you can read what, uh, what he has done, where he has been. He's obviously an armor officer. Uh, but one of the things that really indicated to me, and I did not know him before uh, this year's symposium, is on his own, he organized a group to come down from his command, a group of his commanders and his sergeant's major, to come down and spend a weekend here in Fredericksburg mm -hmm. and attend uh, the symposium that we put on um, for the National Museum of the Pacific War. And I believe they had a great time. He says that especially the sergeants majors, they don't have a, an opportunity to do such a thing, to interact with individuals and hear some unbelievable uh, and very qualified speakers uh, talk on a particular topic and it was actually about leadership of generals, admirals, and presidents during times of crisis. He also indicated to me something else that uh, uh, led me to believe that he really understood what leadership was about. Uh, we have a dinner on Saturday night uh, during the symposium, and I asked if uh, his group was coming to the dinner. The symposium continues on Sunday. And he said, no. And I said, well, where are you going? He said, well, my commanders, sergeants, major, we're going to the Rothskeller, and we're going to drink beer and discuss what occurred today. And I said, hey, here is a guy who absolutely gets it. Uh, we are really honored to have uh, Colonel Richard Creed here as our distinguished speaker. Colonel Creed. That's a really tough introduction to follow, and the chaplain put the double hex on me by saying, or uh, asking for divine inspiration uh, on my behalf, so that's kind of tough. Uh, General Hagee, distinguished veterans, friends of the Nimitz Center and Pacific War Museum, ladies and gentlemen, well, good morning to all of you, and thanks for attending this observance this morning. When I was asked to say a few words here, I was very quick to say yes, despite being an Army officer, and knowing that the Army-Navy game is tomorrow afternoon. <laughs> uh, while not 
maybe being the most well thought out thing I've done recently. Uh, it's the greatest public speaking honor I've ever been asked to fulfill. I was told we would have Second World War veterans here today, including four Pearl Harbor survivors. Gentlemen, it was an honor to meet you this morning. Uh, and it seemed a big responsibility to come up with something meaningful to say to men uh, who lived through experiences to which most of us cannot easily relate, even as fellow veterans. It's unlikely that 70 years have erased the memories of that day in December or the years that followed. Sometimes we look at historical events as, as if they're a moment frozen in time without remembering the things that happened before or after that particular event, which probably affect even more people than were there that day. Pearl Harbor veterans don't suffer from any such misconception. The overwhelming number of sailors and soldiers involved in the battle at Pearl Harbor were men who volunteered to serve in peacetime out of a sense of duty or adventure or simply because the service seemed like an honorable way to make a living and see the world. They weren't looking for a fight any more than the people serving in our armed forces 12 years ago were looking for a fight. They were simply doing their jobs in the service of their country when Japan attacked on December 7th. They were not naive or unaware that the world was a dangerous place before the bombs and torpedoes started dropping, as that letter from the Texan uh, to his parents indicated earlier. There was a war raging in China, and the Germans had overrun all of Western Europe. Submarines were sinking American ships in the Atlantic, and some of those ships belonged to the United States Navy. Knowing that their chosen field of work was potentially dangerous did not deter those who served then any more than it does those who served in the last part of the 20th century. This Naval Museum in the heart of Texas is a reminder of the heartache, the hard work, and the pain it took millions of young Americans to make right the wrong that was inflicted on our nation on December 7th. Nowadays it's fashionable in some quarters to compare with Tom Brokaw, as mentioned earlier, rightly called the greatest generation, with the young soldiers, sailors, airmen, and Marines who served today in Iraq and Afghanistan and other places. And while the comparison is flattering, it's really not very accurate to me. The scale and scope of the experiences the veterans sitting here today underwent during the Pacific War after Pearl Harbor simply dwarf what has happened since 2001 in every single measurable fashion except the length of the conflict. The entire nation was mobilized in one united effort to win and there was very few who could say they were simply spectators to what was going on over those four years. The world has changed a lot since the 1940s, and one thing that sticks in my mind as someone who heard his parents and grandparents talk about the Second World War is that as hated as the Japanese were during and even after the war by many Americans, at least they had the civilized decency to launch their surprise attack against military targets. The people we're fighting now don't even rise to that level of decency. The moral and righteous indignation that sustained the military effort in the Second World War, which inflicted complete and utter defeat upon Japan and Germany, was widespread and shared by almost every American. Being war weary in 1945 meant being tired of rationing, of knowing families who had lost loved ones, of losing sons, husbands, and brothers from every town and neighborhood in the country, at sea or on distant battlefields, with mind-boggling regularity. That, thank God, has not happened in the last decade. That it has not happened should make us even more appreciative of the sacrifices of those who set the standard for duty and sacrifice in places like Pearl Harbor or Midway or Guadalcanal, Iwo Jima and Okinawa. The world is still a dangerous place with people who want to do us harm, but really not as, we are really not as outraged as we were when the ground was still smoking in New York, Washington, D.C., or Pennsylvania 10 years ago. We've lar largely moved on. The people we're fighting are, and, and the ideology they represent are not easy to target or defeat following the conventional methods that we see in the museum in those displays. And instead of depending upon a national mobilization, we settle our national scores with our enemies using a relatively small number of professional soldiers, sailors, Marines, and airmen. And that's probably okay. Because our parents and grandparents, the veterans here today who went before us in the years that followed December 7, 1941, so completely succeeded at their jobs, their missions, their battles, and their war, 
that they gave us the ability to be a little bit complacent. They made the world a better place by making the United States of America a superpower that can afford an elite military. And we need to be careful because we can squander that birthright if we're not careful. Future generations must contribute to a functional society and, and serve should the time to come to defend our nation come again. And as long as we grow heroes, like the ones we found in 1941 and 2001, our world will be a safer and more secure place in which to live. The journey to unconditional victory in 1945 and the world as we know it now began 71 years ago today. We're proud to follow in the footsteps of those who made that journey. Thank you for this opportunity. God bless you, our armed forces, and the United States of America. Rich, I wanna thank you uh, very much for those words. And I do have a, but I do have a recommendation. You need to speak more often to a much wider audience to get that message out. I would ask you to remain seated while we, while uh, Richard Cunningham places the wreath. And then once the wreath is placed, then I would ask you to stand as we have honors for those individuals who gave their lives. Cool. Please rise. Thank you very much for coming. That concludes the ceremony.